Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time you're joining us, welcome to our channel, The Veterans View. Bonjour, bedas again in Dejnaka's magazine on dam boating don jaba. That was just a greeting in my Ojibwe language. Welcome again to our channel. Um, today I would like to discuss uh, the Robinson Huron Treaty. You know, a lot of our communities are, are discussing, you know, uh, what's going to go on with this and what's happening. But um, our, our leadership has been, you know, pretty much silent um, other than spending large sums of money trying to inform us on nothing. That's my opinion again. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, we're just going to have a, a brief discussion on it. And first, I'm going to give the, um, the history on it. Um, I'm getting this history off of Wikipedia, off the internet. Um, so I, I'll just read, I'm going to read off my phone. I wish I could screencast. I'm, I'm not too um, too keen on technology yet, but, you know, maybe as, as these get better, I'll, I'll find a way to, you know, make this better for us. So I'm not just reading to you guys and talking, you know, you can actually visually see some documents, etc. cetera. So um, we'll go by the history. So... The first Robinson Treaty for the Lake Huron region, commonly called Robinson Huron Treaty, was entered into agreement on September 9th, 1850 at Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, between Ojibwe chiefs inhabiting the northern shore of Lake Superior from Batchewana Bay to Sault Ste. Marie and the Ojibwe chiefs inhabiting the eastern and northern shores of Lake Huron from Sault Ste. Marie to Penetanguishin and the Crown represented a delegation headed by William Benjamin Robinson. It is registered as the Crown Treaty Number 61. These principal men on behalf of their respective tribes, our bands, voluntarily surrendered, ceded, granted, and convey unto Her Majesty, her heirs and successors forever, all their right, title and interest to and in the whole of the territory above described together within the islands in the said lakes opposite to the shores thereof and inland to the height of land which separates the territory covered by the charter of the honorable hudson bay company from canada as well as all unceded lands within the limits of canada's west to which they have any just claim of the other part, save and accept the reservation set forth in the schedule. The bands are given a one-time payment of 2,160 euros, which is equivalent to $263,172.41, or U.S., $335,916.85 in 2019 terms of money distributed amongst themselves and annual payments of 600 to each band. The schedule of reservations created as a result of the Robinson Huron Treaty and signed by the subscribing chiefs and principal men are as follows. So there's a list of uh, the principal men, you know, in Wikipedia, I'll, I'll leave the link in the bottom because it's it's quite to read and it's it's very, uh, gives some description of, of what was given to us for that. You know, there's 17, uh, you know, principal men and their reserves that had some agreements there. So you can go and individually read what was promised and uh, it'll give you um, some foresight on that. But... Um, I want to discuss, you know, um, the economist um, in this uh, is saying $126 billion, um, Ontario generated revenue um, and the First Nations is owed at least 84% of that or well over $100 billion. That's what the economist is saying. So there's 21 First Nation communities in the Huron Robinson Treaty. So we have less than 20,000 Indians for 21 reserves. You know, I can get into 
Um, the old saying, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. You know, the, for example, there's, there's a chief for every thousand or less than a thousand Indians in Ontario, in the Robinson here and Treaty alone. That's not including the other, other reserves. So, so we're very much divided. You know, just, uh, and to go back into, you know, what the chiefs are making for what they're leading, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, uh, another thing um, we got to put into mind that our leadership and the negotiators of the Robinson Huron Treaty, they're paid for by the federal government. I want to make this point because it's essentially the federal government negotiating with the federal government on what to give the Indians. Again, I'll say it. First Nations chiefs and councils are, are paid for by the federal government, which mostly are our negotiators, and they are negotiating with the very government on what to give the everyday Indian that isn't a chief. And it's behind closed doors. No, nobody knows what is being negotiated. So, so it's, it's a big red flag. You know, how can they be negotiating in the best interest of their people when they're not even informing their people what they're negotiating. You know, it's, it's a tough one because I sit back and like, our leaders ran on, on the basic principle of they want to give more transparency. You know, I believe there's a lack of any transparency. You know, there's no knowledge of what's being negotiated. So... In that, you know, I, I got some great ideas what could be negotiated. Not once have I heard any of these chiefs discuss anything for the future generations. My great-grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. Because I firmly believe that if this isn't done right, it is our last chance at a large sum of money. Um, we were given residential school money. We were given 60 scoop money. We were given all kinds of monies over the years. Whitefish Island money. You know, and uh, this is our last chance to, to financially get something to gain for our future generations. You know, how about make, here's an idea. You know, some, some communities in our, in our great north, uh, do not pay for natural gas or their hydro. Um, reason being is these communities decided that all their infrastructure is running through our lands. Why should we have to pay for that? So I'm going to put forth to our negotiators of the Robinson here on treaty. Please try to find a way to make a meaningful change so that people will remember what you've done. And giving the everyday Indian a break on their natural gas and hydro, which comes from our lands, to not have to pay for that ever again. You know, and the members that are on the system that the bands are paying for their natural gas and hydro, let's up their style of living just a little bit more. Because that's money in our families' pockets and, and we can in Increase the living standards of the people on the system if we just covered the natural gas and hydro. That's potentially five to seven hundred dollars per household in our First Nation communities that are paying hydro. That's a lot of extra money. That could be a car payment for a family. That could, uh, you know, be some extra clothes, uh, another week's worth of groceries. You know, the list goes on 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 how our people can benefit with just a little bit of extra jonias so i would propose to the negotiators maybe put something in there like that so people will remember exactly what you're doing instead of doing something behind closed doors and then coming to the everyday indian and saying ha ha this is what i negotiated for you here you go this is what i think is best for you it's frustrating you know, there could be meaningful change that people will remember for generations. You remember the negotiators of the Huron-Robinson Treaty, what they did? They gave us free power and natural gas for life. 
were less than 20,000 Indians in this whole treaty area. I think that would be meaningful change instead of just throwing a sum of money at us. Another thing, I think uh, no Indian in the Robinson Huron Treaty area should ever have to pay for their funeral again. Why should we have to pay to go back into the ground? You know, so uh, these are some ideas that should be put forth to relieve the burdens on the everyday Indian. You know, plus give them, them some money. If we go back to the math, um, over $100 billion is owed to the First Nations on what the economist said. So if we just do the math, I'm going to round up just, just for numbers sake, okay? So say we have 20,000 Indians, which we don't in the Huron-Robinson Treaty. We have less than that. But for numbers sake, let's take the $100 billion, which they say is owed to us, divide it by 20,000 Indians... And what we get is five million per man, woman, and child. That is what the economists said is owed to us. So if we don't get anything close to those lines, can you really say that they negotiated for the best interest and the future of their nation? You know, and that's why I think this is very important at time in our history that if if they don't negotiate this right or they don't do this right you know i don't want to be in 10 15 20 years saying oh my goodness what did they do what did they do for us nothing we're stuck now so you know that, that's my bit on, on on a bit of the the robinson here on treaty if i'm wrong you know or or have, you know, call me out, you know, say I'm wrong, say I shouldn't say these things, you know, because I just want to get these ideas out there because there's nobody else discussing these other than what our leaders want to tell us. You know, in our community now, there's all this discussions going on X number of dollars. I heard the number 810 million given to Batchewana is going to be given to Batchewana First Nation. So again, I'll round up just for numbers sake. Say we have 3,000 members in Batchewana First Nation and we have 810 million. Potentially, that's a rumored number that I heard is coming to our community. Do the math. It's 270,000 per man, woman, and child. That's far-fetched from the 5 million that the economist said is owed to us. 270,000 would be nice, but will we ever see that? I highly doubt it. You know, so there's some, some ideas here for some meaningful change, you know, and uh, I hope our leaders have the resolve and, and you know, uh, integrity to start having some discussions with their people on, on what maybe they would want, because maybe it would change the ideas and discussions on these tables. Because everything is held behind a closed door. Again, the federal government, chief and council, negotiating with the federal government what to give the everyday Indian. Which is unfair. I don't agree with it. And a lot of us should be upset too. So I'll close um, this brief discussion on the Huron-Robinson Treaty. And, um, you know, I would really like to put it to our leaders to remember our future generations. Remember our future, what, what is going to happen in our community in 20, 50 years from now. Because, uh, you know, sadly, with when this, when this is all said and done, there's going to be another paper coming behind it. It's going to be a land agreement. And we can probably get into that in another discussion, but you can go to any First Nation that signed on to these land agreements and go to those communities and ask them if it was a good decision. They're going to tell you, no, it wasn't a good decision. So leaders, please, in the best interest of the future generations and us, do something that is going to be remembered forever. Please stop filling your pockets and remember the everyday Indian. Bama Pigawamin. Until the next video, see you.